Subject color and magnets are the first two things anybody should learn about color. Not knowing these concepts can lead to random results, and as you can probably tell already, luck is a terrible tool for any artist out there. This video is about color theory, but despite what you might think, this is not a video about these color harmonies. These are useful tools, but that is not the foundation of color theory. That is the way that color theory was taught to me as well, and I regret teaching my art students color theory starting with those steps. I now understand that that is the second step of learning color theory, and this video covers the foundation that is required to understand how to even use those different color harmonies. Color theory is built on tension and eye movement, and those are the things that we are gonna learn right now. And if you watch this video until the end, I will give you a roadmap how you can master color by following this exact template. I'll also show how this theory looks in practice and how you can actually use this in your own artworks. The final step is important where you actually put this information into your own painting, because even though the theory is easy to understand, I've done this long enough that I know that a lot of art students destroy their entire painting in the beginning by starting out the wrong way. But first, we need to understand how we block in and use these colors. When you have an understanding of how subject color and magnets work, you can use this information and turn the whole concept of color from this mysterious black magic into a useful tool to enhance your stories. Okay, let's get more creative. When you start designing color, you need to answer this one most important question. And you can't cheat, you can't just do your painting and figure it out later. You actually need to answer this question, like I do with every one of my paintings. That question that I hope that you remember every time that you paint after this is where do you want to guide the eye of your viewer? This simple single question already decides the colors for you and it's the cornerstone of all the other decisions that we are going to be discussing later. Now pay attention to how your eye moves in these example images. I know that eye movement is something that is really difficult to notice at first, but these are very simplified examples. You can also challenge yourself to notice how several of these rules are implemented in this painting process as well because these rules apply not just in this painting, but in all paintings, not just mine, but to every single picture ever made, subject color and this tension through magnets, these rules are always in play. Once you understand how a picture is constructed, you can use those rules as templates for your own artwork. Don't worry, there won't be any test on this later. In fact, I'm gonna give you the answers to how this picture is constructed, so you can see if you guessed right or if you understand the construction of this piece. That way you will have one more reference point on how all of this works. Let's say most of your colors are blue, and you add this element into your piece. Now your painting is not about blue, it's about this yellow blob. This is a subject color. Accent color can be wherever on the picture plane, even as just decoration. But a subject color is like a voice shouting, hey! Over here, please look, I'm right here. Subject color is like a lifeboat in the middle of the sea, firing a rocket so that it can be seen more easily. It's begging for attention. That is the subject color. When we see this color, that is what the painting is about. What this color is doesn't actually matter. Hiding in plain sight is the real reason why your eye moves here. The surroundings. Think of this area as a pedestal for the subject. The less noise this stage has, the easier it is to bring focus into your art. Think of subject color like instructions for your viewer on how to read your art. This is why that question is important, because you knew that they are gonna be looking here, so that's why it's designed to be in this location. This is a skill that you can use as an artist to pull these invisible strings and guide your viewer to your story or whatever is the most important thing in your painting. 
and that makes your message more impactful. Even if the area I want you to focus on is the exact same hue, the same color, you can still use saturation or value to direct the eye here. There's actually a really cool assignment in doing this, but let's first go over to the other key fundamental we need to know about color. Magnets. Even when the subject color is a bunch of different colors, we still gravitate towards it if we are using saturation or value in the surroundings to do so. You can break things. Now pay attention to what happens to your attention when you see this. Learning to understand this tension in your eye movements is essential not only for learning color, but also for mastering composition as well. The subject color here still works as intended, but our attention makes these little jumps to the part on the right. These colors have a magnetic pull towards each other, and the magnet that pulls the strongest has the biggest contrast. That can happen through saturation, value, or size. We can even add multiple smaller magnets like this, and we are building a pathway for the gaze to jump between these points of interest. But you notice that it's returning here, where there is the greatest amount of contrast, true saturation, value, or size. Now the thing that all art students get wrong at first is that they treat the canvas like a coloring book. Especially if they have line art before they start the painting process. Now there's nothing wrong with having line art, I think that's great to be prepared that way, but I am just highlighting this because it's more likely to lead into this mistake. When we are kids and filling a coloring book, we tend to fill each segment with different colors. It doesn't even occur to us that we could add a blue area next to a blue area. And when we move into the world of painting as adults, we still carry this same way of approaching color. When art students fill different areas with different colors, it's impossible to tell where to look because the viewer needs to decide what's important in the painting. It hasn't been decided for them. And this is also about painting in a kind way, to be clear and kind to your viewer. Decisions like these, knowing where to look in a painting, they cause visual fatigue and they don't invite the viewer in. So be kind. When you are doing the first block-in colors of your piece, especially when you're working digital, don't be afraid to have dull or desaturated colors. It's much easier to bring that saturation and contrast in later. You can use that base to bring out your subject color and magnets, no matter how you use them. You can level up your painting skills super fast if you let go of the idea that every time you put in a paint stroke, that is gonna be in the final painting. That is the first layer of color that you are putting in there, that's the beginning of the process, and that doesn't mean that that area is finished. When I do my block-in, I proceed with the assumption that all of this is going to be painted on later. In fact, getting the canvas covered quickly is important, because if you fill in each area little by little, you won't be able to see or make any decisions about your subject color. The base white will be the subject color until it's gone, so please don't think of your line art like it's a coloring book. Because the white will have such a huge contrast in value to the, all the other colors in your painting, that it will be the thing that draws the attention until it's covered by something else. So that's why the first layer is the base, that's the beginning, the starting point of the painting, not the finished one. I often think of this process like decorating your house after moving in. You first have to carry in all of the furniture before you move into details such as decorating. Blocking in colors is carrying the furniture in, and the design process of color is moving those colors around and making sure whatever feng shui you are going for is working as intended. Often when a student shows artwork that they're not happy with, they're so dramatic about it, and they say stuff like, it didn't turn out as I had hoped. That is really common, but I always think of that as something that has no drama attached to it. My response is always, okay, you have begun the painting process, but it's not done yet. What are you trying to communicate? What is the story of your piece? And how is the subject color indicating that? 
how are the magnets in your painting leading the eye into that area of the painting. There's always a way to fix a painting, especially a digital painting. There's always a solution. In fact, there are always endless amounts of solutions on how a painting can be fixed. That's why I'm not a big fan of the whole paint over way of teaching art, because it sometimes implies that there's one fix that needs to be made, when that's entirely up to the artist. It's usually just a matter of understanding that this creative process is sometimes a lot more involved than we initially think that it would be. You don't need to finish your art in just one sitting in one day. Give it some time, and that way the rest of us can understand the message as well. This is where we can loop back to the exercise that I mentioned earlier. A good starting point is to make a painting with only one color. This way it's much easier to notice how value, the lightness or darkness of color and saturation can create contrast that focuses the attention on your subject. So you can use these tools to create your subject color. From that point onward, it's easy to learn color if you take it one step at a time. Use two colors. This way you can experiment with those color harmonies that are the next step. Each one of these color harmonies are good exercises to make. They get harder in this order. At every step, remember to decide the subject color and then pay attention to the magnets in these more complicated color schemes. I started this painting from a pride flag because I did this right before pride week started here. That's a really weird way that I definitely don't recommend to anyone. I had all these super bright colors that took a lot of time to prioritize and organize. I organized my subject colors in this ring in the order of rainbow hues. And after that, the rest was just rendering work, really. That stuff, rendering, anyone can do. I have faith in you. It's the design part that is the hard part. Here, you can tell that the subject colors are marked with saturation and value in this region. I'm also using lines to provide tracks for the eye to travel between the magnets. As you are learning these different color harmonies, you will also notice that there's a different level of tension between different areas of the color hue. So the further apart the colors are on this hue ring, the more tension there is between them. So a cyan blob on a blue background, that doesn't have a ton of tension. So there you need to use those value and saturation tools to make it into a subject color. But if it's from completely the opposite side of the hue ring, then it's much easier to turn those colors into subject colors. And there's a ton of tension there. But same goes for every other object and item that you are painting in your scene. So knowing how much tension they take is a constant thing that you need to be paying attention to. But when you understand subject color and the way that tension works through these magnets, then you will have the tools to balance even those more difficult parts. If you want me to make a video that goes more into depth about color theory with the different harmonies, let me know in the comments. And if you want to learn how to use lines in perspective, check out this video.